Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. So the journey for solar energy from being a novelty technology to a bona fide part of the Carolina's energy policy and electric generation portfolio has not been smooth or linear, but bumpy and highly debated. So where are we now? And how much solar can be depended on to carry larger and larger loads of power? What about general and broader policy? Is solar still discounted and only considered a nascent solution? I'm Chris William, and on this edition of Carolina Business Review, we will discuss the implications and the advent of the solar industry right here in our region. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Gary A. Lanier, Columbus County Economic Development, Ivan Erlob of the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association, Brett Sowers from the South Carolina Solar Business Alliance, and Sarah hummel Reka of the South Carolina Solar Council. So welcome to our program, uh, lady, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's Thank good you. to have you back, Ivan. Um, Thank you. This might be uh, very uncomfortable for you, so I'll just I'll just tell you that right off. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, talking about something near and dear to all of y'all's heart, and that is solar in the Carolinas. Sarah, um, you know we we've seen some headlines recently. There was a I'll call it a bit of a scare, but there was a disruption in the gas supply to the Carolinas because of a problem with a gas line in Alabama. And this comes up every few years where we see a disruption, whether through a storm or through some technical issue and prices at the pump go up and people start getting a little twitchy about the cost of gas. So does this lean in to the argument that solar, and it sounds leading, but does this lean into the idea that solar really could be a more dependable power source? Um, I think so. I mean, it definitely shows that. I think it's not necessarily, you know, about being a dependable power source. It's always has been dependable, especially, you know, during the day and, you know, certain parts of the country obviously get more sun than others, but it's really about diversifying and solar can definitely be part of that mix. And I think, you know, the country's definitely feeling it with the growth of solar over the last five years. I mean, dropping in prices 80% in five years. I mean, what other industry has done that? The demand is there and people are recognizing that it can definitely be part of the energy economy. So Gary, you, you're an engineer. I mean, you've got some of that DNA in your background. You look at things critically. You, you know, you can figure out how these things work. Can solar, and I know we're doing it to some degree now, but can solar really ever get to the point where it can be scalable, cheap enough, where you got a, a very uh, high, return on investment, very low cost to get in and to uh, flesh this out. Can it be a major part of a portfolio? Certainly, we're a scientific society. We know how to make things better and better and better. Solar panels that were put in in Columbus County five years ago, compared to the panels that are going in today, those panels are scalable 30, 40% more efficient. And that was in a five year period. So where are we going to be in 10 years, 15 years? I could see solar energy generation efficiencies going through the roof because we have very smart scientific minds working on the problem every day. So Brett, you're, you, know, you were in Charlotte, now you're in Charleston. Did this job, solar, you're a proponent, you're an advocate. 
Um, do we, and I know you're passionate, uh, and, and again, I want to ask this question uh, respectfully, and I think you'll understand where I'm going with this, but do, do we get this idea, I mean, it's certainly a great technology, we all understand it, as Gary just articulated, the cost to produce energy is getting much more efficient and much cheaper uh, for these panels. But are we are we romanticizing this almost to the degree that solar is not going to be able to fulfill our fantasies to to really be a good base load provider? It's a good it is a good question. Uh, it's difficult to answer. I think that you can romanticize the the uh, solar industry. It's um, a lot of people are very interested in it today, uh, but we're seeing some improvements um, when you include things like battery storage to the declining cost of the solar cell um, and how we're, how we're manufacturing, installing, and asset managing um, utility scale solar farms and with including battery storage, I think you can have mm -hmm. uh, a consistent base load. Um, and not only that, we need to be just thinking more about new additions onto our grid and uh, what's the lowest cost to do that, that can provide the customer with the most reliable option? Ivan, you know, last but not least, at least right. in the opening part of the program. So wh what is the risk in, in developing this, in, in getting, so let's say that everyone in North Carolina buys what the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association is selling around the idea that we need to be leaning more into solar generation. Mm -hmm. And um, c c can solar, it's not, again, the right way, but can solar deliver at any scale? Is it scalable to what, what needs to be scalable to? Yeah, the, the inflection point we're at in our economy uh, with the technology and utility business models, the financing world, is that we're about to graduate from just thinking of our energy resources as single things and starting to look at them as a system and how they work together. We just heard from Brett. Uh, we can talk about solar as base load when we cup when we look at it how it performs in the system couple it with energy storage we think about uh, how we reduce our energy use elsewhere on the grid so on and so forth what is the role of the customer the utility and mm -hmm. industry in doing that that's where the dialogue is moved into uh, that's where money is ready to have that conversation and that's where industry is starting to deliver utilities feel that pressure and s are starting to see and wrap their hands around that opportunity so we're seeing more innovation in business model, in financing mechanisms, in consumer consumer understanding is getting savvier. So this is going to be a, a steady progression of kind of learning together, doing together, and, and driving down these costs, not just of solar, but really of the whole system. So what we're really trying to, I think the end goal we're trying to get on is affordable, accessible energy that is more local, it's cleaner, it's just really better for us in many regards but in a way that works for the utility and the consumer and industry. So it's it's not just about fulfilling a, a renewable energy standard that both states have in the mm -hmm. in the energy portfolio. Somebody gave me the metaphor, and, and this is not flippant, but they said, you know, solar is almost kind of like at the children's table at Thanksgiving with, uh, so, with wind <laughs> and hog waste. And you probably just recoil at that one. But, I mean, does is solar graduating into a different now level of power generation? Look, look at the auto industry. You know, there was a book called The Machine That Changed the World, and it was all about the automobile, not the computer. And look at where, car, where the car industry is going with electric vehicles. Self-driving? Yeah, self-driving, yeah. but, you know, my wife's Prius gets 51 miles to the gallon. That's unheard of. When I was, you know, first started driving, it was 18 miles a gallon was a great mileage. Now it's 50. And that's all because of battery, you know, electric assisted automobiles. Where will that be in another 10 or 15 years? So is, is, the, is Moore's law, and we all know about Moore's law, that the technology will double what? Every two years, three years? Is Moore's laws more or less applicable to what's going on in solar? Not with the solar cell technology. Uh, it, it's not increasing uh, nearly that fast. Um, and many scientists will, will tell you that it can only reach a certain point of efficiency. But I think we've heard those uh, in, in past decades as well, and we've, we've already exceeded those. Um, so the science can only go so far today. I think what's really important for um, the economy to be uh, looking at is solar is deployable rapidly. Um, as we consider our growth and a growth economy, mm -hmm. how do we bring on more energy? Uh, capacity, uh, and you can do that through 
through solar pretty quickly, um, where it takes a lot longer to build a nuclear facility, many, many years of planning, many, many years of permitting and construction. Uh, same goes for other sources of energy. You know, a couple of you had mentioned this whole idea that it's indivisible right now. Solar is indivisible with the storage of electricity. Um, how much does that factor in? I'm looking at you, Ivan. How mm -hmm. much does the storage and the cost of storage factor into what the end rate for solar generation is? Well, right now it's not common to couple uh, solar uh, power generation with a storage technology. It's increasingly common. We have a number of um, uh, industry uh, participants in the Carolinas adopting that, but it's really going to take off over the next 18 months because, as uh, Sarah noted, the cost of solar has come down dramatically. In the last 18 months, the cost of lithium-ion batteries has come down about 70, 70 percent, uh, and that will continue to decline similar to solar's history. Electric vehicles are following the same path by extension of that lithium-ion battery experience. Um, so putting these technologies together what is the ultimate installed cost? What ROI are, is the customer looking for? Uh, what is the utility allowed to offer and do? What will the regulator allow them to do? At mm -hmm. what prices? How do we put that into the rate design uh, um, that we, the rates we pay on our bills? Um, we're right at that moment where if we answer those questions well, we will absolutely position the Carolinas as a national and even, even global leader. Can you answer those questions well with the fluidity mm -hmm. of, of this technology, mm -hmm. with the policy that hasn't been decided on really? I mean, there seem mm -hmm. to be so many moving parts. And mm -hmm. Sarah, I'd like you to kind of jump into this right after uh, Ivan gets the chance to take a swipe at it. Uh, the, the, everyone is seeing that they really need to come together and answer the remaining policy and regulatory questions. And, and they, they are answerable as long as we're willing to admit that everyone's interests need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. do, you get the, do you get the sense, Sarah, and this is not to put you on the spot, but, and, and not to paint anyone as a bad guy or, or wearing a white hat, Duke Energy, Santee Cooper, Scana, the co-ops, um, all of those players in the Carolinas around energy, uh, do you feel that they are much more uh, amenable to a dialogue around solar and how that fits into a portfolio? Um, I think so, and it's, I think the, the tone, um, as somebody who moved from a very high solar state, Arizona, to South Carolina five years ago, where, I mean, there just wasn't an industry in South Carolina, and companies in South Carolina were doing business outside of South Carolina, mm -hmm. um, to now the enormous growth that's taken place since Act 236, which is the legislation that was mm -hmm. passed over two years ago, really prompting the solar growth over the last year. Um, I mean, the players came to the table. They knew that something had to be done. And we had, you know, utilities, we had um, the state energy office, conservation groups all at the table who said, solar's coming, we're ready to embrace it, let's move ahead and see what we can get um, in terms of legislation. Mm -hmm. And I think that will continue to come. And, you know, storage is definitely there. They see, you know, utilities see how that could work. Um, customers see how that could work. Even co-ops in South Carolina are looking at, you know, let's go to time of use because battery storage is going to come on board. And right now, custom, solar customers can adjust their mm -hmm. use to help with the time of use costs um, and use solar at other times of the day. But when batteries come on board, they can easily put in batteries and help with that time of use, as can you know utility scale storage. Mm -hmm. Those peak times, it's covering those peak times, and that will definitely be a factor. Yeah, and, and Brett, I don't want to let you out of this dialogue because South Carolina seems to have vaulted ahead of North Carolina when it comes to residential application or the deployment of these cells on Han homes. So before we do that, Columbus County, North Carolina, Gary has been uh, pretty unbelievable when you look at the critical mass of solar farms. Mm -hmm. um, comparative to the rest of North Carolina, that seems like that, that's, you know, and the, the range of distributions when we talk about standard deviation, Columbus County's way out here because it's, it, it, you've done so many things. How have you gotten that done well, and how have you been able to do that within county government? Uh, well, one big plus is we've added about $300,000 a year to our tax revenues. Just but that, that, that comes in arrears. How did you sell this idea? Uh, I think, you know, we were in the recession. Nothing was happening with economic development as far as new industry coming in and building $5 million buildings. So we turned and looked at the solar industry when they approached us as a potential partner to help continue economic development. 
you, you'll have 100 people working on one of these farms for four to six months, and then they move right from one to the next. So that gave employment opportunities to some of our unemployed workers, and it added to our tax base. So the things that we had to deal with was public perception. I don't want to look across the street and see a solar farm. So we implemented a special use permit policy, and part of it is you have to have a two-row vegetative buffer that'll grow up to the height of the fence within five to six years. We even tell the developers what kind of native plants work well. You know. And by working and listening to the public and integrating those, their comments and concerns into our policy development for special use permitting, we were able to work together with the solar developers and the public and it's really helped a lot of our small farm families to diversify their income streams. Did you feel like you got a lot of help on Raleigh and the General Assembly? And this is, was this a self-starting Columbus County initiative? We always have worked well with our legislators in, in Columbus County. We've got some very forward-thinking mm -hmm. representatives. Uh, but the policies were already in place due to folks like Ivan's mm -hmm. work in the past, and we just kind of took the ball and ran with it. It, it. So Ivan, you know, you just kind of threw the ball to you here. Okay. <laughs> um, how has Columbus County done that? Why not Mecklenburg, Wake County, Buncombe County, some of the more what mm -hmm. has been traditionally thought as progressive place to do some development? Yeah, so um, being in eastern North Carolina, uh, the land is flatter. Um, there's a lower cost to development. Uh, there is the electric grid mm -hmm. out there and getting access to it. You're uh, fewer competing land uses mm -hmm. um, to get in the best locations. Mm -hmm. um, also, there's um, uh, economic um, op development opportunity, as Gary just mentioned, um, is also desirable. Uh, so it's just easier to develop in the landscape of eastern North Carolina is in the in the Rocky Mountains, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, of western North Carolina, for example, yeah. uh, as well as um, with the costs previously being much higher than they used to be, it was extremely important that you could go to those locations first where you could get the greatest economies of scale at the lowest possible um, cost of doing business. And so it was a really nice marriage, I think, mm -hmm. um, for bringing economic development opportunity and also in a situation where the cost of, of doing business could meet solar industry where it was mm -hmm. at. So, Brent, South Carolina, um, and Sarah, I'd like you to wade in on this as well. So South Carolina seems to have moved ahead of, of the Tar Heel State on the development of these cells on personal residences. Has that been because of favorable legislation, tax policy, um, even some givebacks or some type of uh, uh, rebate from the state or the feds to the personal uh, homeowner? Or is there something else in, in that's going on in South Carolina that's worth knowing and needs to come to light? No pun intended. Sure. Uh, I think the, the main reason was legislation. Uh, state House or federal? This was state legislation that was passed. Uh, what Sarah was referring to, Act 236, mm -hmm. passed in 2014 in South Carolina, required three carve-outs. Carve-out for residential, commercial, and utility-scale solar. Um, what we're seeing the rise in residential is because the utilities are incentivizing customers uh, to install solar on their homes to meet that cap, meet that requirement, and the utilities had five years to do it. So they started with heavy incentives uh, to give customers. What we're seeing now is that the incentives are now gone and customers are still buying solar. Uh, as more installers have come into the state, as more loan products for homeowners are provided through finance years. Local banks are getting um, more familiar with how to loan to a, a homeowner that wants solar. We're seeing solar grow without incentive mm -hmm. um, or adou without additional incentive. We still have the federal tax credit. When do they sunset? Uh, the federal tax credit in two years will move down to, I believe, 22 percent, Ivan, if that's correct. It's at a 30 percent right now. I don't remember right off the top of my head. Yeah, we have six years on the federal but even that doesn't that big that doesn't sound like a big move, Brent. From 30 percent to 22 percent, it's not going to not going to be. It's restricted. not a big move, and we have a state tax credit that's 25 percent, uh, or capped at 35 thousand dollars. That tax credit doesn't help a utility scale development, but it really helps a residential mm -hmm. customer. Sarah, yeah, thoughts? because that's, I mean, so between the federal tax credit and the state tax credit alone, that's 55 percent in tax credits that somebody could take. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, of but, the overall project. Yes, so of the over half of the cost. Right, over half the cost you would get returned to you in the form of credits, and then you would also, um, you know, through the past few years we've had a twenty five percent percent state tax credit. It's been huge. It's been twenty five percent for over five years. Mm -hmm. It's also been education, and that's what Act 236 really did, is it pushed the utilities to offer additional incentives. So we got the incentives, we got the return on investment down to, in some places, for commercial, it can be three years that it's, the system has paid for itself with those incentives. Um, on a commercial business or on a home business, it can be as little as six years. And so getting those prices down, people see it, They you know, the education is there too. They see it on their neighbor's house, they start to talk to them, they say, oh, that person's like me, and they've gone solar. It beco it's become truly not something of the future, but something that they could put on their mm -hmm. own home. And, and it does save money, and the return on investment has, is there. Is this pushing North Carolina at all to consider this? Is North Carolina close to some type of residential standard to, with the same type of incentive in play? Not the same type of incentive, but there's definitely ongoing discussions about um, what's the next transition. We had a state tax credit for a long time, right. expired at the end of 2015. When you coupled our state tax credit with the federal, it came out to roughly, on average, 48% of the installed system cost. Cost of installed systems have declined. There is currently no utility rebate programs in place. And we have um, net metering. so. Um, you can turn your meter backwards basically when you're using more than you need at any given moment mm -hmm. and get credit on your bill for that. <clears throat> so as long as we keep that the same. Uh, one difference is um, retail rates for some of the utilities in South Carolina are higher um, than some of the utilities where we're most likely to see uh, real near-term growth is that based and, uh, on rooftop solar? I'm, I'm sorry, Ivan. Is that based mm -hmm. on geographic location or time of day that your rate will vary if you're um, selling it back to the? It's very uncommon so far in the Southeast United States uh, for residential consumers to be on a varying rate during the time of day. Flat rates is what we have, okay. and our rates designs are riddled with hundreds of cross subsidies all over the place for everything you could think of. So net metering mm -hmm. is still highly contested. I, I think it's probably fair to so, say. So yeah, well suffice to say net metering isn't the problem. Uh, it's really force for the trees. It's arguably if you really looked at the opportunity cost of debating net metering, uh, you'd quickly see that it's a lose-lose for a decision maker or utility to fight over it. Mm -hmm. um, the real opportunity is looking at like what is the utility business model continuing to step up um, service to consumers as being the preferred provider of service of the future. Um, these are really big opportunities for utilities, electric membership co-ops, municipal utilities, as well as the big in investor on to, to get ahead of the curve, break through, and partner up with industry and deliver consumers what, the, what they want. And when they do it that way, you can almost guarantee that our, the way we plan it is going to work for the grid and probably put us on a good path to affordable yeah. future electricity. So, G Gary, you're, you're over there nodding to a whole bunch of things, and I'm yeah. trying to figure out what you're nodding to. So what do you, <laughs> what do you agree with? What I, do you think? All of it. I, 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 I'm, I'm a, a firm advocate of it. And, you know, the, some of the negatives we hear, we've, we've dealt with them. You know, oh, all of our farmlands getting covered up with solar panels. I did an assessment of all. We're... we're in a lot of areas of Columbus County, we're reaching what would be considered a saturation point. Mm -hmm. Just you can only put so many solar farms on a substation. And when I calculated it, everything out, Columbus County has 954 square miles. There's 640 acres in a square mile. And I had, I have extremely high output in Columbus County, but yet there's less than two tenths of one percent of our land mass has been covered in panels. So the argument of, oh, we're gonna cover yeah. all of our great farmland up, it just isn't the case. It's it's a great resource that needs to be exploited. Uh, Gary, thank you. That's gonna be, uh, by the way, as an engineer, well articulated, well argued, thank you for that. That'll <laughs> that'll be the last word. Uh, thank you for making the trip from Whiteville, Tabor City, we love that part of the state. Uh, thanks, Ivan. Thank See you. you soon. Um, uh, Sarah, thanks. Welcome. Uh, glad to have you from Arizona. It's a good place to live, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. I mean, South Carolina. I love Carolina. South Carolina. Yeah. yeah. Brett, uh, good to have you on the program. Thanks. Thank you. And Appreciate welcome it. back. Uh, thank you for watching our program. If you have questions or comments, whether it's about solar, uh, whether it's about anything going on, please go to carolinabusinessreview.org. Thank you and good night.
Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.